I'm here today um, to talk about a topic that I think we all have in common. It's a common passion, a common belief, uh, a strand of DNA that holds us all together, and it's this topic of greatness. And greatness and creativity really go hand in hand, right? So we're here at 99% because we believe in what's possible when creativity meets the world, what happens when we make things happen. So I start out this conversation today by looking at that intersection and looking at a conundrum. It's, a, it's almost a paradox, which is we tend to think of creativity as the work of a soloist. And what's interesting about SY Partners and what we've learned over the past two decades is that, interestingly, virtually all acts of greatness are the work of an ensemble. So this inherent contradiction, this kind of, your role as a soloist, your role as part of an ensemble, is what we're going to explore today. And it's really to get into this notion, and I'm going to try to share some lessons learned about what it really takes to be a great team. I'm a really big fan, if you have a uh, responsibility of being on this stage, that you declare your biases and your context up front. So these are our secrets that we're sharing with you. Whether they become your secrets depends a lot on whether we're copacetic and what our background is. So um, let me tell you a little bit by context about SY Partners. Unlike most of the other speakers who are um, quite visible, a lot of our work is actually quite confidential, so we don't get to share it very often. If you know us at all, you know us uh, for our work that we did. Some of you may have seen this. It was an exhibition on Lincoln Center this past year done with the IBM company as they are celebrating their 100th year anniversary. It was an exhibition dedicated to looking at how to improve the way the world works. And IBM, as you know, because they, it's all about data and data rushing through our systems. How can we use this natural resource? It's bountiful to make the world work better. My point is not so much IBM, although I adore IBM and this project was a lot of fun. The point I want to make is really about the team required to do it. So if you imagine you're doing all of these real-time grabs of data all over New York City, you're putting them up on a digitized wall to teach people what they can do. We did a 40-screen uh, version of an immersive film that you literally walk into. That film resolves to 40 screens where you can dive more deeply. We involve scientists mathematicians, programmers, designers, project managers, brilliant scientists from IBM. Oh gosh, hi guys. <laughs> it's like, there's an amazing front row that I didn't know they were here, so it's like, step back just a little bit, sorry, <laughs> to be so in your space. Um, what's, what's really required is this great ensemble is a diversity of people, okay. If you know us at all, it's for our transformation work, so, um, you know, we talked earlier that 100-year-old companies are very rare. Um, we work side by side, Howard Schultz, on the rejuvenation and reinvention of Starbucks. And the first work was to work side by side with their leaders as they refound their mission and purpose as an institution. Literally, they rewrote every single word down to the last punctuation mark. This alone, I think, is a feat, and we'll talk more about purpose in a moment. But I think in terms of being able to do this for a team that does it, you have to figure out how to mobilize them. And so we did a series of experiences around the world. This is a 12,000 person event in New Orleans over four days where they brought in all of their store managers from across the globe for a four day recommitment to what the company was about. Okay. So if you know us at all, you know us for that. Now, I'm gonna take you into a part of the company no one except the SYP, the SY Partners people know, you're gonna get a first glimpse at something. So we um, have built a product division that's trying to take the two decades worth of knowledge that we have and offer it up in a more human, um, interactive form. And so let me give you a little tour. So we have an office in San Francisco and we have a studio here in New York so if you get off uh, the subway at 18th Street and 7th Ave and you go into 218 West 18th Street and you go past our amazing guard and you get in that elevator and you punch the 10th floor, you'll be in the presence of our team, which is truly an ensemble. So it, we have strategists, 
writers, psychologists, sociologists. Um, it's a place, and we take this notion of greatness really seriously. So right before you enter the door, clients and SYP people alike, it's now in a world that too easily settles for less. We believe it's worthy work to envision, fight for, um, and believe in greatness, and that's the work we do every day. So when we pass through that door every day, that's the hope we have, is that we can make a difference. The same with every client who comes into that door. So let me take you into the studio. It's actually built for collaboration, so really this notion of ensemble is that first you have to have a place. So whether it's virtual or in person, you have to create an environment where people can be their best selves. In our particular case, we have lots of collaborative areas, we have lots of places you can have quiet conversations. We have big rooms where you're able to put up all the work on, on the walls and take a look at it. Let me take you around the hall, though, into the heart of this product group because it's, we're really dedicating kind of new knowledge to the world and offering up as digital tools. That's Nancy Hawley there who leads one half of our product team. Um, we uh, took 20 years of knowledge and tried to aim it at the soloist. So for those of you who have that kind of genius of creation, that have that kind of moment and spark, what we realized is that brilliant people, great people who are soloists get stuck all the time. In fact, the people who get stuck most often are the people who try to do the most, who aim to do the most, who aspire to do the most, because you hit that boundary every time you engage. So we created this application. It's been out five months or so now on iPad. And um, I'm going to give you a little tour because what it teaches us is how vital it is as soloists to get unstuck. So we've, we've basically created a very easy way to help you get in touch with what causes you to get stuck. So you get into a moment where you're like, I can't go forward. I don't know how to go forward. Use this app. It helps you focus on it. It helps you figure out how you're feeling. It helps you understand what the roadblocks are. It helps dig out of you what you already intuitively know about how you want to get unstuck. And when you put it all together, what it does, it has a pretty sophisticated algorithm in the back. And it comes up with a very simple, but often searing, telling of why you're stuck. And once you do that, once you go, yeah, that's me, that's me, you raise your own belief, you raise your own agency, you can do something about it. And we provided 11 tools that you can use to get unstuck. Why do I bring this up? The next lesson of being great is you have to develop your own unique method of getting unstuck. If you truly want to be great, you have to find your rhythm. You have to find your you know, pattern of how you do it. Um, there's about 150,000 people who use Unstuck regularly, um, and it's helping them find their pattern. Okay, so that's the soloist part. Um, but that doesn't, uh, um, doesn't take um, account of the, um, the ensemble part of greatness. So it turns out that great teams don't just come about by chance. You know, it's very rare that you get a group of people and magically they become a great team. In studying this, gosh, we probably have worked with, I don't know, more than a thousand teams over 20 years. I think what we figured out is that the great teams really work hard at it. They cultivate specific habits that they do that make them great. And so, um, at SY Partners, and this is the first kind of time we've talked about this, so Scott, we'll see how this goes. Um, we're working on an application called Teamworks. It will be available on iPad, your notebook, PC. Um, and uh, we'll, we're going to go into a private beta soon, and then uh, we'll launch it towards the end of the year. Teamworks is built on analyzing these you know, several thousand examples we've had with teams and what their key habits are. And what we've learned is that great teams, when they really are at their best, start first with the foundation of each person on their team understanding their superpower. What they do better and more extraordinarily than anyone else on their team. That becomes important because if everyone's playing to their superpower, you get great permission to work on work that has great purpose. 
and that the, the habit of purpose building. What does this mean? Why should we care? Why is this interesting? That purpose making turns out to be absolutely essential to how teams become great. And does it feel intuitive? I mean, in the cases where your team has lacked purpose, it's just work. It's just the list of to-dos. It's just actions to take. They're not satisfying. When you have a purpose, what becomes vital as a habit is understanding the forces at play around your team. What's going on that might prevent you from living up to that purpose? What's going on in the dynamic of the team? What's going on in sometimes the bigger institution that's around you? Your team has to be able to see vividly that whole landscape. From there, you can make bold moves. The biggest mistake teams make is they don't make good choices. They try to do everything, and therefore, they don't focus on the most important thing. To do that, you have to see the outcomes. To do that, you have to be resilient and be able to build the habit of reframing. So um, what's kind of wonderful about plans, right, is they're almost often broken by what actually happens in the world. The world throws us all these things that we were unexpected, right? So a team's resilience, its ability to reframe something, to make it positive, becomes an essential habit. This all runs on trust. We have a particular term at SY Partners we call duo. So it's the, the smallest atomic unit of trust, you and me. We have nowhere else to shovel the blame. I'll come back and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Great teams, when they're really at their best, what they determine is that they have to build belief in others to take action. Because actually greatness, usually, whether your greatness of a small project, whether it's a greatness of an initiative, whether it's a greatness in what your whole company's doing, whether you're trying to make a world scale thing, whatever your definition of greatness is, it almost always requires building belief in others so that they'll take action. If you put it all together, the last thing that really tucks this all together is the habit of, um, Decision making. And it can be decisions about how to use your time, how you channel your passions, how you use your capital, how you use your imagination. Decisions of how we need to work together become vital. Okay, now if this seems intuitive you, to you, that's a good thing. You know, if these nine things resonate with you, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. So because we don't have forever together, I'm going to take the rest of our time to just go deep on three of these habits. So this first one, see great teams see the forces at play and they learn how to capitalize on them. So you know, you're sitting here with your project. Um, one of the things that creative people often have trouble with is we, we focus so narrowly on the thing on our desk. Seeing the forces at play is actually taking a much broader view. It takes you uh, to look at all the forces at play. So what is the essential capability that you need to build? And interestingly, it's this um, ability to see. Now, this seems kind of silly. So when you're in a creative you know, place such as this, everyone says, well, of course I can see. Of course I'm, I can do this. And actually, what it turns out is most of us are pretty good at looking. We're not great at seeing. So what is seeing? Seeing is what lens you decide to put over your eyes as how you see the world. Do you see possibility when you come to a new situation? Do you see waste that could be eradicated? Do you see how team um, in, um, interactions work? Do you see how time works? Do you see the flow of things? Do you see where things get stuck? What lens you choose to use is directly correlated with how effective you are as an individual and collectively as a team what you can do. So my advice here for all of us and what we've learned is your ability to switch lenses, to be able to go from belonging to waste to time to flow in any given situation that you encounter is critical to your success. It's not just to literally look at the world, but to take it in and see what it actually means. Second thing is this notion of superpowers. Um, so it's kind of interesting. So the way TeamWorks works, it's a little bit similar to Unstuck, is we are building a really sophisticated algorithm underneath it that diagnoses when you use the application what's really going on with you. And in order to do that, actually, you don't start with the uh, computer science. 
you actually start with an understanding of human beings. And the way you do that is you run a bunch of prototypes. So actually, um, in your chair when you walked in today, there's a little stack of cards. Um, take it out if you get a chance. They, they, in theory, um, they should be right under your seat. Below the flotation device, So here's a little prototype, and we wanted to give you this prototype because it's at the point now where it's about 95% accurate. And um, what it helps you do is figure out what your superpower is. So again, your superpower is what you do uniquely um, better than anyone else on the team. And let me just show you how you use them. So, and you can do this now, or you can do it at a break, or you can do it at home, or you, could, you can't really do them in the shower. but. Um, <laughs> So what you do is you place them white side up. You put two cards down on the table. You read the situations. This is just like real life. Given the left situation or the right situation, what is more likely you would get called in on? What would your colleagues do? They say, we want you for this. Take, discard the card that is not you. Keep the card that is more you. Draw another from the card. Try it. Discard again the one that doesn't apply to you keep the one that does apply to you. These actually get harder. So the deeper you get into the deck, your decisions about what is more you, you have to be absolutely truthful with yourself about how to do it. And, and that's actually just like life too. So if you cheat yourself by lying to yourself, you're not gonna be great, I can tell you that. <laughs> so what happens is you just keep going through these cards. The very top card that you will leave on the table will be your, flip it over, and it will be your superpower. If you felt really torn and had other things that you thought were close, pull them out of the deck and flip those over as well. Those we would call your secondary superpowers. What's important is, and this is where the advice comes in, it's amazing at how much people allow and settle for time in teams where they are not using their superpower. Once you know your superpower, your job is to stay in that zone as long as you can in every team interaction you can. Why is that? One is you will be happier because your contribution will be based on something you love to be and your team will be better off because it's your true talent that you're bringing to the table. So one suggestion is do this. I'm actually going to be around at breaks and things. If, I'm happy to read your cards. I've done this <laughs> hundreds of times now. It's like, it's like tar tarot cards meet psychology in a good way. Um, but do this activity and spend the next week consciously choosing how you spend your time. Consciously saying, am I contributing my superpower? Do other people know my superpower? To make this a little bit more tangible for you, I'll tell you um, a little bit about our team. So our New York team is run by two people. Maria Nunez here, her superpower is energy. Anytime she comes into a room, she absolutely lights up a room with energy. Her business partner, her duo in crime, is Tom Andrews, whose superpower is systems thinking. This, this combination of energy and superpower of systems thinking is an incredible match because the two of them together set a great culture of the office. Now, it's pretty normal to put someone at the head of an institution who has systems thinking. Systems thinkers typically make the best top leader. What's counterintuitive, though, is where else do you need systems thinking? So Guillermo Nogori, Spaniard, fiery. Um, he's also part German, so he's actually kind of organized as well. <laughs> he, you run studios, you know this exact challenge. Um, Guillermo is also a systems thinker, and this is extraordinary. So to have someone at the creative helm who has systems thinking is incredibly valuable. Grit. Kate Boydell, incredible grit. We send Kate in when the situation is tender, complicated, political, requires arduous work. Kate brings her entire soul to that project. What I'll say, though, for people with grit is you've got to make sure you tend to yourself because people with grit tend to take the weight of the world onto themselves. So if you're one who does your card thing and you have grit, my warning is you've got to stay whole to you. You also have to have a cultural compass. You have to have someone who says, what is the moral conscience of the institution? What is in our character? Someone who will stop us from making mistakes that are out of character and keep us going towards the things that really matter. Contrarian views. 
My advice on this one is if you want contrarian views, hire a Frenchman. <laughs> this is Nicolas Maitre, who's absolutely one of the brilliant partners at SYP. He is so contrarian, but not in a negative way. He's contrarian in an absolute positive way where he takes a turn and makes something great out of something that seems so sensible, he twists it just a little bit. Sometimes you just need ambassadorship. So your kind of idea out of this is to use those cards to get to your diagnosis. Just try to live it for a week. Take a diary of it. Because when you do, I think you'll find at the end of the week, you find your work much more passionately. I'm at the end of my time here, but I'm just going to give you one last hint, which is about duos. Duos is the smallest atomic unit of trust you can have in a team. If we are connected as a duo, we must work it out because we can't blame anyone else. You know, Charles and Ray Eames are one of the great duos that I have consistently respected in the work of our studio. Husband and wife, designer team. You know, Charles was supposed to be the scientist, but Ray made it human. He was the one who came up with many ideas, but she made it real. She was the one who started with whimsy, and he added logic. And then they kept switching roles until they did brilliant things. Think about the top 10 duos in your life. Write them down. Go through that list regularly and see how you can build strength in that relationship. And I'll give you the one secret before I leave the stage. It all comes down to how you react in that duo at any moment. You have two choices always. Do you respond with a sense of love? Do you respond with a sense of fear? We find the best way to build duos is to extend that love and trust before it's safe for you to do so. And in that act of generosity, that's where greatness lies, because that's a direct invitation to whoever's across the table from you to come sit on your side. So those were the three hints, and I'll leave you with one final thought about building these habits. We started in our New York office, and we're going to end in our San Francisco studio. This is what it looks like at the end of the day, heading back out. Um, some days are good days. Some days are incredibly difficult days. Some days make us laugh, and some days are actually very sad and make us cry. When greatness is your thing, there's a lot of disappointment built in. But the thing that we remember more than anything else is that greatness is the act of being courageous and courageous enough to be fully yourself and then surrendering, surrendering to an ambition that you share with others and go change the world. Thank you.